I'd like to uh, reopen, it, reopen the uh, public hearings for the 2020 special town meeting. Uh, good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement for, of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the Arlington Redevelopment Board is convening via Zoom conference as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. I'm going to uh, run through our um, and confirm that all members of the redevelopment board are here and then I will run through um, some uh, requirements for uh, for the for the public hearing for anyone who wishes to speak tonight. So uh, to run through the list of the Arlington Redevelopment Board meeting uh, members, if you could please identify present when I call your name, Ken Lau. Here. David Watson. Present. Eugene Benson. Present. Katie Levine Einstein. Present. And Rachel Zemberry, I am present. And the staff members from the uh, Department of Planning, uh, Jenny Rate. Present. And Aaron Zwerko. Present. Great, thank you. So tonight is the third night of uh, the hearings for the 2020, the public hearings for the 2020 special town meeting articles. Uh, the first two were on Monday the 26th and um, last Thursday evening for a total of six warrant articles. Consistent with the past um, Arlington Redevelopment Board meetings, we will be hearing from the applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. The board will pose any questions to the applicants uh, after the applicants present their article, but we will reserve discussion and voting on each article until after they are all completed, which will happen after we close the public hearing this evening. Uh, any person wishing to speak at the zoning war warrant article public hearings will be given an opportunity to do so in accordance with the following procedures. The subject matter will be the hearings that are posted on the agenda. So tonight that is article 21. Persons wishing to address the Arlington Redevelopment Board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall signify their desire to speak by raising their hand when the chair announces consideration of such item. To raise your hand in Zoom on your computer, go to the participants section on the bottom of your screen and select raise hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak by the chair, such persons will preface their comments by giving their first and last name and their street address. People addressing the board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall limit their remarks to three minutes and may be allowed to speak more than once at the discretion of the chair. The board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Those persons present at the public hearing are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken at such hearing. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. Speakers should address questions through the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the Arlington Redevelopment Board members or other hearing participants. Questions may or may not be answered during the public hearing. And with that, we will move to our agenda item for this evening, which is Article 21, uh, Zoning Map Amendment to Rezone Town Property. This is to see if the town will vote to rezone a parcel of land belonging to the town of Arlington with the access from Grove Street and being identified by Map 54, Block 3, Lot 2.B from R1 to I in terms of the zone or to take any action related thereto. 
So with that, I will hand it over to Jennifer Rate from the Department of Planning uh, to give us some background before we turn it over to the applicants. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's Jennifer Rate. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. I'll be brief as the petitioner has a presentation um, to make to the board. Um, in brief, this uh, article is meant to rezone this one lot of uh, town-owned land that is currently zoned R1, which is the uh, residential district for single family homes, to industrial, which is the abutting um, land use. And you can see that on the map here that all of the purple is zoned industrial, which includes the uh, DPW complex, the current complex. The majority of those parcels are already occupied by DPW properties, but there is a proposed expansion of the salt shed and they'll describe what that will look like and what that means um, onto the abutting parcel that happens to be zoned for R1, which would need to be rezoned to industrial in order for that use to be accommodated. Um, there's already an existing curb cut and uh, it is currently used as, as a driveway already. Um, but it does need to be rezoned again for this particular use um, as it is restricted. Um, the project need is somewhat imminent. Um, and of course, the petitioner will describe what that process means and what they're seeking and the timeline that they're looking to achieve in order to develop the property um, for the new DPW facilities. Um, in part, this will last, the construction period would last for a couple of years. Um, and as you can see, the estimated timeline for completion is 2023, uh, based upon my memo and, and information that I've received from the uh, petitioner. Yes. And they will be providing that information again in their presentation uh, so that we can learn a little bit more about their timeline and uh, the needs related to this particular parcel. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Mike Rademacher to provide an, a further introduction of this article, as well as an introduction to the architect um, who will be making a further, uh, provide further information to the board and the public. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Jenny. Mike, would you like to um, begin your presentation? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Mike Rademacher, the Director of Public Works. Uh, tonight I have with me Jeff Alberti and David Steves, both from Weston and Sampson. Uh, Jennifer, Jenny did a, a very good job um, kind of teeing this up uh, for, for them um, with some background on the project, but David is, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Jeff uh, is going to, has a presentation he'd like to make to further describe uh, the, the reason for the request. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, would it be acceptable to, for me to share my screen so I can control the presentation or would you prefer that I just um, work through your end? Jenny, I'll leave that up to you. I'm not sure how you have this presentation. I think it would be easier if you just tell me which when to advance. Okay. Please. All Thank right, you. sure. Um, so if you advance to the next slide. Um, so this presentation is to provide an overall summary of the project, uh, which includes the request to rezone a parcel of land that was mentioned earlier belonging to the town of Arlington to accommodate what we're referring to as municipal facility, which includes the DPW yard renovations. And the site is located at 51 Grove Street, as mentioned. And the reason we refer to it as a, munici as a municipal facility is because the facility does include uh, public works, but also has some support functions internally for the Inspectional Services Department, Facilities Department, and IT, IT Department. The project includes the renovation of four existing buildings. Those are shown to the left on the photograph on the rendering on, on the bottom, as well as a new uh, facility shown on the right, which is the new operations building. The project also includes a salt storage structure, which is in the back right behind the new facility, as well as a fueling facility and a municipal parking area to the right. If you move to the next slide, this is just an overall view of your zoning map and just outlining the proposed development area that shows the zoning districts, I being in purple and the R1 in the beige color. And moving to the next slide, this is just a zoom in of the site. You can see the two lots. And I'll just refer to them as lot 2A, which is the industrial in purple, and lot 2B, which is the R1, as mentioned earlier. And to the next slide, just rotate the site a little bit to give you an overall view. This shows the two, bar two parcels combined at 5.95 acres, and approximately 4.42 is in the I district and 1.5 in the R1 district, showing the 
uh, current use of the sites between DPW as well as uh, part of it is a existing practice field area that's shown to the left. Moving to the next slide. So when we began this process, we started by really focusing on the original development area and that's shown in yellow. And that original development area was being programmed to support DPW and ISD. So as you move to the next slide, this shows you the next three slides and you can go through them slowly as we go here, but they show you the options that were developed early on to provide space for DPW and ISD. So that was option one. The next one is option two. So you can see we're primarily staying in the developable area. And as you move to the next one, you have option three. So what we determined is with the current program needs and with the parking needs, we're able to fit DPW and ISD. As you move to the next slide, you can see that the town had, through the development of the high school project, the town had requested that the facilities and IT departments be relocated from the high school to the DPW site. And this required approximately 11,000 square feet of building space to accommodate that, as well as an additional 30 parking spaces to accommodate uh, the staffing for IT facilities and associated visitors. So we evaluated that yellow shaded area the 4.4 acre parcel to, to determine if we could further expand it. And I think from showing you those options, there really wasn't much left, much room left. So we determined it was not suitable to just build within that developed area. And we began the process of looking at that adjacent parcel, the existing practice field area. And working closely with the high school design team at the time, uh, we made a joint decision to provide a central parking area on that former practice field area and that would also provide a third access point to the school for uh, any future needs and really more uh, for emergency needs at this point. The field area, what's important to note, was historically used for industrial purposes for a large storage tank. And I'll show you a photograph of that, that in a moment. And it does have historic contamination and essentially is covered by a, a Massachusetts Dep Department of Envi Environmental Protection engineered in contact barrier. Sliding over to the next slide, this provides in overview, you can see the large red outlined area to the right is the high school and to the left is the DPW facility, the smaller enclosed red area. And you can see the area in yellow that represents the portion of the practice field that is proposed to be converted to parking on the high school project. As you move to the next slide, you can see a concept plan showing the high school and that proposed redevelopment area outlined in yellow for the high school parking. And then you can see the other area that we've identified to be pr proposed to be developed for the municipal facility. And as you go to the next slide, you'll see the concept overlaying on that as well. And you can see that it primarily includes uh, a parking area, but it does have a portion of the salt storage structure and the fueling facility that falls within that parcel. And I'll show you a, a more detailed plan in a moment. As you move to the next slide, I just wanted to outline uh, what we have for these, what would refer to as direct contact or engineered barriers. So there are three barrier types. They include the paved direct contact barrier, a field direct contact barrier, and an engineered barrier. And as you look at these, what you'll see is that the entire R1 area has historic contamination based on its former industrial use, and it is covered with a complete mass DEP barrier. If you move to the next slide, this shows on the plan below shows you in these red circles, this represents what are referred to as the MG, MGP gas holder locations. MGP stands for manufactured gas plant. So this is where the manufactured gas was stored. And you can see in that photograph, that historic photograph, the large tank that was historically located on that site indicating its past industrial use. And that's also apparent from the fact that there's associated contamination uh, with that. Moving on to the next slide. This shows you the proposed plan development and we've identified the new and renovated structures in beige. And you can see the gray area represents the uh, paved areas. This shows you the overlaying uh, in zoning districts with I on the right being in purple and R1. And this is overlaying over the proposed development. So. As you can see, a majority of the structures, both the main new structure as well as the uh, existing structures to be renovated are on the I parcel. 
And you can see just to the bottom of the bottom right of that R1 symbol, you can see the salt storage structure, which has a portion of the structure extending onto that parcel and the fueling facilities directly above that. And then the remainder of the site is being proposed with the uh, paved area for parking. As you move to this next one, this is what we're proposing is to change this so that is a consistent I district for the two parcels combined. I think just as a quick side note, what you find through the development of this compared to what exists now is that a majority of the operations will now be enclosed and undercover versus what you, what you have now, which is a lot of equipment and materials outdoors, which essentially will be an overall improvement for the operations and for this site. As you move to the final slide, this is just a wrap up and summary. Uh, what the town is requesting is that lot 5432B be changed from the zoning district R1 to I. And that requested change is consistent with the historic use of this parcel for industrial purposes. As evident by that gas tank photograph I showed you earlier, how it's been historically used along with the historic contamination and the, bar the engineered barriers that exist on that site. And because of that historic contamination and those barriers, the site cannot be used for residential use. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the decision was made with the high school project team to convert that field into a parking area for a central parking area for both uh, facilities with a third access point provided. And this will provide the town with a consistent zoning district for the town yard municipal facility, allowing them to meet the project goals and apply appropriate and consistent zoning criteria for the development of the site. And more importantly, this zoning change will support the development of a new municipal, municipal facility, which houses operations which, which are used to support the essential services that they provide to the town on a daily basis. Thank you for uh, running that presentation very smoothly for me. I appreciate your help. And that is, that is it for my presentation. Great. Thank you. Mike, did you have anything else to add before we turn it over to questions from the board? Uh, excuse me, nothing, nothing really that, that, fall, that, that says it all. Um, as far as timing goes, we are looking to um, begin construction uh, in the spring, in the upcoming spring. And it looks to be uh, currently a, a two phase project, which would take about two years. Great, thank you for the additional information and thank you for the very thorough presentation as well. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Ken. Sorry, it took me a while to get unmuted. Um, yeah, it was a very good presentation and uh, um, I, I'm generally supportive of, of this. I just have one question. Uh, that used to be a practice field, which was uh, mainly grass, right? Correct. And you're going to cover that field. Um, what are you guys going to, how are you guys going to handle the, uh, the runoff, rainwater? There will be a, a stormwater system design that will capture the rain, the, the runoff and, and hold it in a, in a tank and to allow it to release slowly to mimic how it, 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 it acts today as a, as a grass field. All right, so, but that, but uh, it would be some sort of a uh, holding tanks underneath the parking structure, right? Or Correct. underneath, but it won't be located. Um, well, is there some sort of separation between that and the contaminated soil? So that yeah, you're not pushing correct. the stuff elsewhere? Correct, right. So. The way the field is now, it has a, an engineered barrier to prevent stormwater from migrating through it and to, and to propagate the, the contamination any further. And what we'll be doing is collecting the rainwater uh, you know, through catch basins into a very secure tank that would not allow it to also would not allow it to permeate into the soil. It would be held in this tank and discharged slowly um, to um, uh, existing drainage in the area. Okay. Um, are you guys plan, planning to plant any um, trees at the perimeter? Uh, uh, Jeff can speak to it, but I believe a landscape plan is, is still under development. Yes, that is still under development, but we are looking to um, improve some of the screening on the perimeter, um, subject to uh, provisions of meeting the DEP requirements for the barriers. So this is 
some restrictions that we will have to follow. And so we're in the process of working through that. So you might have to put them, put them in some sort of planter maybe, right? So the root system don't get into the, into your barrier you're putting in. Correct. Okay. Um, I have no, I have no further questions, Rachel. I'm, I'm, I'm generally supportive of this. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the very thorough um, presentation. Are, are you going to have to go before the Conservation Commission for any of this? Uh, yes, we've actually uh, filed with the Conservation Commission. We met with them informally and then submitted a notice of intent. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. This seems to make sense to me. Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David? Well, I'm excited to see this project going forward at the DPW yard. It's long overdue. Um, did you guys perform a um, parking utilization study of both the existing and, and proposed parking? And uh, how closely matched is, is the capacity you're building to, to what you actually expect to see? Uh, we have, we spent um, quite a bit of time understanding the parking needs for the operations and for uh, potential public visitors to the site. And um, we feel that we've adequately covered that. Uh, one of the important things to note is that you can see that there are several buildings on here, but most, a large portion of these buildings are just used to house actual storage of vehicles and equipment indoors. So um, we have done that uh, parking utilization for the intended use and have that covered based on the plan that we've developed to date. Was there any uh, investigation of uh, using some kind of a parking structure instead of surface parking? We actually did uh, early in the process when we developed alternatives, we did look to see if we could go with a parking structure and uh, determine that uh, number one, it was very cost prohibitive. Uh, we had issues with the um, contamination and what would be required for our foundations associated with that, but more importantly was um, the access required to get uh, up on that structure was prohibitive uh, from a space utilization need on the site. So the, 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 major, uh, the major factors against a parking structure were, were engineering related rather than cost. Yes, it was primarily operationally related. Okay. All right. Um, well, you know, I don't, I don't love seeing uh, green space paved over, um, but uh, I, I don't see that we necessarily have an alternative here. Uh, and uh, I am concerned uh, that, uh, that you guys, um, uh, do improve the screening um, around the perimeter of the abutting properties. Um, and uh, it does sound like you're doing the best you can with the wastewater, uh, the runoff. So uh, I, I really don't have any other questions. Great, thank you, David. Katie? Um, thanks for the informative presentation to my colleagues for their questions. I have no further questions. Thank you, Katie. Uh, any further questions from the board before we open this up for public comment? Seeing none, uh, we will open this up to uh, any questions from or uh, comments from the public. As a reminder, each person wishing to speak will have three minutes. I will ask that you share your first and last name and address before you begin speaking. And if you'd like to speak, please use the uh, raise hand function in the uh, participant section in the uh, bottom of your Zoom screen. So I will take the speakers in the order in which they have identified uh, the request to speak. Uh, the first will be John Warden. Can you hear you? Yes. Yes, we can hear you and see you. All right. All right. That's good because I, I'm having to listen on another computer in order to get the sound. 
Um, so it's a little confusing. All right, <clears throat> I've, I've got a couple of, oh, John Word and Jason Street. I have a couple of questions. Uh, last year, the uh, Public Works uh, of, had an article that was turned down by town meeting to seize a little historical house right at the periphery of their property to use for, I don't know, some purpose. Have they given up on that idea? Yes. Not, not included in this parcel, right? Is it appropriate for me to speak? Uh, please go ahead. Yes, you can answer the question. Yes. Yeah, no, that parcel um, is, is not uh, part of this um, project or this request. And, and the other part of my question is, have you given up on the idea of taking that historic house? Yes, um, the, the, the original intent for taking that property was to provide an efficient uh, driveway through the site to the high school. Um, what we've done is design a parking lot and a driveway that can provide on occasion access to the high school. But it was designed such that um, in the future, we could potentially consider alternatives. But as of right now, we have no intention of taking that property. Thank you. Uh, next question. Why, why don't you use imper, impermeable, I mean, permeable paving uh, where, where the grass is now? Well, one of, the, uh, one of the issues with that field is that we have contamination under it. So even though it's grass now, there is a barrier underneath which prevents rainwater from actually getting deep into the soil. It's basically um, uh, like a plastic sheet, for lack of a better term, that directs the water into a drainage system before it can get into the soil. So putting in the permeable pavement, would we would still have to collect it right underneath it and dispose of or, or, or direct it elsewhere. Um, so, and that would be a very costly way to do the same thing we're doing with the catch basins and the and the sub storage. All right, and, and there's, you claim that you need 30 parking places. There's, there's no other place on the site. I mean, I, I really feel badly about taking a field away from the children. The, the, the high school is already losing its its front yard for this yeah. enormous building, and and now you, now you and now you want to take away this little practice area for the for the children, which seems, for, for parking, which just it seems like a wrong kind of choice in this day and age. Um, yeah, I can sympathize with that, um, Mr. Warden, and, and we did give a lot of consideration to parking options and locations. Um, having employee parking within the facility is not a, may, does, not re, do, does not allow for a secure facility to allow uh, private cars to go within the facility, nor do we have the room uh, to do so. Uh, this is going to be parking for four different um, town um, uh, uh, functions, public works, uh, uh, information technologies, the facilities department, and uh, uh, inspectional services. So it's, it's, um, it would be hard to disperse that parking throughout the site. But uh, understanding your concern about the playing fields, I believe the high school's plan expands the current Field, fields they have now. They have, a so, they have a baseball and a softball field. And my understanding is those current fields will be enlarged so that they can both house, one could have soccer as well. And I believe the other one can have lacrosse and or another soccer field. So the, the fields are being enlarged and, and, and being made more useful than they are today. So we're hoping that it will recoup the loss of this practice field. But they're also re re removing the basketball court, uh, which is widely used by not only the high school, but, but a lot of people in the community. Uh, Mr. Warden, we're, we're at time. And um, if you have any other questions related to the specific uh, zoning uh, change, it, you know, I, I know that there was some back and forth. So I, I certainly allow you another question if you have another question. All right, that's, that's, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you for the clarifications. <clears throat> so the next speaker this evening will be uh, Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Uh, 30 Edge Hill Road is my address. 
Um, I wanted to actually ask a procedural question. I hope you'll humor me with the answer. I noticed there are 50 participants total on this call. And I think a lot of people are here because they have concern over some of the zoning changes, uh, question 18, 19, and the renaming of open space. Could you please tell for people, including me, who are not clear on whether the public will be allowed to give any more public comments tonight, what your plan is? Thank you very much. Sure. The, uh... The public comment tonight is for um, is for the uh, the current article, Article 21. We had public comment that was open for those two articles on uh, Monday evening, um, and I'm certainly happy to take any any questions or or comments tonight on Article 21. So you will not be allowing the public to ask you questions about the items they did not know about before. Uh, again, any any questions um, we right now are for uh, Article 21. Uh, we can still take comments for the for the other articles. Um, I'll open it up for any final public questions or comments after we finish Article 21. Thank you very much. And could you please state how late people can submit written uh, comments for the hearings? Uh, let's see. Well, we will be um, discussing and uh, voting on the items. Jenny, in terms of items going into public record, um, how late can you accept those and still have those uh, be pub published as part of this? This is this is a public hearing. So as long as the public hearing is open and if it's continued, then it would be continued to the next possible evening. But at the moment, this is the last public hearing evening. So it depends. Why don't we see how far along we get with the board, but comments are still allowed and are welcomed in terms of either verbal or written um, or by phone. <laughs> I had somebody call me on the phone. So I hope that helps. I, I realize there are a number of people here who probably are not looking to speak on this particular article, but we should wrap this up before moving to the other ones. Exactly. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, did you have any other comments on Article 21? Uh, Mr. Wagner. No, thank you. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public that would uh, wish to speak on Article 21? Okay, seeing none, I will turn it back to the uh, board to see if there are any final questions or comments uh, on Article 21. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, we will um, open back up or continue public comment for any of the uh, six articles that we have heard over uh, the past three evenings. Um, and again, if you uh, would please use the raise hand function in uh, through the participant section in the bottom of the Zoom screen. I would ask that you please, in addition to stating your name and address, if you have anything that you would wish to contribute, that you also um, that you also identify the specific article number. Jenny, I'm not sure if we could pull up um, the summary of the of the articles. That would probably be helpful for people as well. I, I was about to do that actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the document that's been posted is the one that has all the articles and then the proposed motions. Is that what you're talking about? Please, yes. Great, so I will open that up uh, for any members of the public. Okay, so the first uh, person I have on my list here is Rebecca Peterson. Hello, um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I don't know if I have um, Rebecca Peterson, Florence Ave, 31 Florence Ave. Um, I am speaking uh, regarding Article 16. Uh, I believe 17 um, is the one. 16 is open space. I think 17 is ADUs and or single family zoning. And I'm not sure if I have all the article numbers correct. Um, oh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I, essentially, I'm speaking about uh, 16, 17, 18, and 19, I believe. Um, I sent an email. I didn't know about these meetings and I do get town notifications, but I missed it somehow. I sent an email to the members of the um, redevelopment board tonight, but it was quite late. It was 
just before the meeting. So I'm just, uh, if it's okay with you, I'll just read my email because that encapsulates my comments. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so I have lived in Arlington with my husband and my kids for 20 years. Uh, we love the people, we love the schools, we love our neighborhood, we love the proximity to Cambridge and Boston. However, being close to something we enjoy on an occasional basis does not mean we wish to live in those other communities. The proposal to radically reduce open space, allow unlimited ADUs and eliminate single family housing will destroy the character of Arlington. Town meeting rejected this last year, ADUs. Why would you want to allow something that so many residents do not want? Please stop trying to shove increased density down everyone's throat. If I wanted to live in Cambridge or Boston or Somerville, I would have moved there to begin with and not here. I love my yard. I love the huge trees. I love the parks in Arlington. These articles will do nothing to bring more affordable housing. Just adding more housing doesn't make it affordable. Our schools are already bursting at the seams. I have two APS students. The estimate of one new student for every condos, would I, which I saw in one of these um, articles or, or maybe supporting documentation is laughable. Until the town charges businesses a higher property tax rate than homeowners, the entire cost of this increased burden on the town schools will be borne by the homeowners. Neighborhoods of single family homes exist at all socioeconomic levels and have long been desired by people of all races. Please stop lecturing us about how racist it is to want to live in a neighborhood. I keep seeing documentation about if you want to live in a single family neighborhood, it's racist. We want to live in a neighborhood with a certain type of house or certain characteristics or a certain level of density, most important to us. That's why we moved here. Um, I just say enough is enough. These proposals are too much and too soon. They should not become law in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Maxwell Palmer. Um, hi, I'm Maxwell Palmer. I'm at One Roanoke Road. Um, I just want to speak very briefly in support of the articles on ADUs and single family zoning. Uh, we desperately need more housing in Arlington and both of these articles will make um, substantial headway to addressing those problems. And while there's a lot, been a lot of discussion about affordability and I fully support much more affordable housing in Arlington, we also need more market rate housing. Uh, many studies have shown that allowing more multifamily housing reduces the price of the new housing that's built. Uh, the new condos will be less expensive um, than building new houses. And while that's not going to address the affordability problem, at the lowest end, it will address the need for more housing and by increasing supply will reduce uh, housing prices as well. So I strongly support uh, both of these new articles. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker this evening will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, uh, Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road, Arlington. Um, I just wanted to very briefly touch on something Mr. Palmer said, as it was entirely false. Um, when you add new residential housing in any town that is in a democracy, the people who end up paying more are the people who move into those units, the people who rent those units, and the people who pay property tax in the town already, because they always are going to have an increased burden due to more residential development. And for the last two years in Arlington, Mr. Palmer should be aware that every unit created costs more than the unit it replaced. And it makes sense. Developers are only going to build market rate housing when they have an incentive of profit to do it. But tonight I wanted to specifically turn to the board and ask you to reject articles 16 and 18 and 19 on procedural and process grounds, if not democratic grounds. First of all, open space being devalued to primary and secondary uh, space is just silly. The towns around us, and the communities around us don't do that. It makes no sense. 
it can only be explained as the proponent mentioned in that it's going to be part of future propo uh, proposals they give us for, for uh, devaluing our open space. But on 18 and 19, this is the critical and very large negative change that Arlington faces. And how many people know about this? How many town meeting members even know about this? How many of you on the ARB knew about this until the citizen proposals were brought to you? It would be wrong for such a poorly understood set of very dangerous density initiatives to go before you get approval, go before 300 or whatever they are, people in the town meeting who are trying desperately to understand it, when in fact 43,000 people are affected, when in fact low and middle income, seniors, people of color, people on, on fixed incomes will be affected, displacement, major changes to the town, in addition to making us more urban and making more units. So I ask you, do not support Article 18 because there's just not enough public awareness at any level. And I ask you, do not support Article 19. Ms. Rate particularly should know this because if the planning department can be prevailed upon by the Dem Democratic people of Arlington to not support it, it is illegal because it was asked just last year of the town meeting. So please do not support the uh, Article 19 because it's not right and it's, it's um, coming too soon. It's much more dangerous than the one rejected just a year ago and allow for much more public awareness, input, and uh, surveying of what the public wants to do before you support anything like Article 18. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Marina uh, Popova. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marina Popova. Uh, I live in Arlington at 255 Ridge Street. Uh, and I guess uh, I also want to comment on the article 16, 18, and 19, and I totally agree with what Rebecca and Carl Wagner uh, said before. I do not agree with what uh, the other uh, participants, sorry, uh, I lost the name, uh, was saying. But the main question that I hope that the board, uh, before they vote, will actually ask themselves is, who do you represent? Do you represent the actual residents of Arlington? or do you represent a very few rich people who actually will profit from this new development? You have to understand that there is no actual benefit for people who live in Arlington, who are the residents now who pay a lot of taxes, a lot of uh, property taxes to support and develop our beloved city. There is no benefit to those who actually live in the Arlington. The only people who actually will benefit from those articles are those, again, who will do the new development and who will profit from that. So when you vote for those articles, please ask yourself who you are really supporting. Are you supporting the people of Arlington? Or are you supporting those who are very rich already and will become much, much more rich from these articles if they are approved? All right, that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll just also state for the record for clarification um, that the uh, petitioners, um, the only article, there seems to be some confusion, the only article that was actually put forward by the Arlington Redevelopment Board uh, is Article uh, 20. Um, we are hearing all of the articles, the six articles, uh, the other five being uh, presented by petitioners um, from, the, from the town. So. Um, just to, for clarification on, um, on the articles themselves. Uh, the next speaker tonight will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street on Article 18. The number one reason that has been given for eliminating simile, single family housing uh, zoning is to correct a racist legacy. I don't doubt those books and academic papers that claim the intention of single family zoning was to exclude people of color in many cities across America. But was it true of Arlington? I'm not an academic, I'm an engineer, and I like to use data that is specific to the problem at hand. Fortunately, we do have some good data. I looked at what people were building in Arlington before we had zoning restrictions, when they were free to build whatever they wanted. Prior to Arlington's first zoning map be behind me in 1924, People wanted single family homes and that was what was built. 20% of our housing stock today comes from these pre-zoning houses. Many remain single family homes. The others have been converted into multifamily, 
either condos, two family or three family. Think of some of the fine large Victorians found all over town. I also found an early zoning map thanks to Richard Duffy. When zoning was first introduced, roughly half the town was zoned for single residents and half was zoned for general residents. The single family districts seemed to have been placed where many homes had already been built. The general residence districts were placed in neighborhoods where lots were waiting for new development. In other words, our earliest zoning actually encouraged multifamily housing development. But here's another interesting thing. People kept building sim single family homes anyway, because that's what they wanted. Take Webcowett Road as an example. Many of the homes on that street were built in the 1920s when it was zoned for general residents. Yet people chose to build single family houses there anyway. Racist zoning had nothing to do with it. Today, the market demands are different. So on what Cowett Road and elsewhere, as these original homes come on the market, they are snapped up by developers, torn down and redeveloped as condo duplexes, each unit selling for nearly $1 million. Let us dispense with this notion that Arlington zoning was intended to be racist. In our period of greatest growth, we permitted very, very small lot sizes and encouraged multifamily development. We did the right thing. For a racist attempt, look first at the builders who put in deplorable deed restrictions. Look at the bankers who refused loans and look at the brokers and realtors who steered away people of color. That's where the racism occurred. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Elisa McDowell. Uh, Elisa, are you still there to speak? Okay, uh, we can come back to Elisa. Um, we'll keep your, I'll keep you in the queue. Um, and if you have any difficulties uh, coming off of mute, uh, please, please let us know. Um, the next uh, person, I don't have a, um, a name. Uh, it's a phone number ending in 428. Hi, good evening. This is Elizabeth Dre. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 8. Thank you for your time. Um, I am alarmed. I'm sorry, could you uh, state your address for the record, please? I'm on Jason Street. Thank you. Sure. So I'm, I'm calling to ask you to vote against Articles 18 and 19. I am alarmed um, that these are coming in front of us uh, on November 16th without any kind of community outreach. Um, from what I remember, last time the accessory dwelling units was proposed, that, that was withdrawn pending need for future studies and outreach, and I don't believe that that has happened. Um, and, the, and the zoning changes being proposed in Article 18 are, are huge for the town. And I don't believe enough people have had the opportunity to learn about these proposals and voice their concerns. So I ask you to vote these down and give the public an opportunity to give their input. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I'll go back to Elisa McDowell. Oh, thank you, I figured it out. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, this is George McDowell. I'm here with Elisa. Uh, we're at, we live at 90 Valentine Road. And I'll just read my, my little prepared statement regarding uh, Article 8, 18. Does anybody in this meeting disagree with my contention that 99% of the Arlington townspeople have no idea that you are now considering the most impactful changes in the history of this town? Does anybody disagree with that? No. I ask that regardless of your position on the article, you table the debate, do not proceed until this has been put to a town referendum or at the very least made known 
to the town at large. This is not representation. This is a betrayal of the, of the people of Arlington. And I ask that you stop now. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Stacy Slate. Hello, my name is Johannes Epke. I live on Teal Street in Arlington. Uh, I am speaking in favor of increased density, especially the ADU uh, article, as well as the single, single family housing article. I'm glad that previous speakers brought up the issue of, of race and, and how that interacts with, with zoning in, um, in cities. And um, a lot of speakers have raised the intent of the zoning as, as a, an issue to look at. I think that the function of the zoning is more important to, to consider. Um, these, uh, these types of zoning restrictions have been used um, since the um, redlining and exclusionary zoning have, have been outlawed or, or racially explicit um, exclusionary zoning have been outlawed. And the, the function of these restrictions has been to keep people out of a town. You know, we use phrases like character of a town and, uh, and things like that, and, and that we like the people here and that the people here don't want that. The function of that is to, is to restrict other people from, from coming to these communities. Um, you know, I, I like Arlington, I like the, the community here, I, I love being a member of it, but I would love to see more diversity. And more houses means more people can move here. You know, we, we talk about um, this benefiting only the developers. That's not true. It also benefits people that can't afford to live here or can't find a place because the market is so constricted. Uh, adding ADUs and, and increased density would allow for, for different people to move to Arlington. And I think we have to um, open our arms to that possibility or else we are, we are stuck where we are and, um, and, and I am opposed to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Stacy Slate. Sorry, was that just who we had here? The race, uh, we'll go to Mark Rosenthal. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good, yes. Um, I'm Mark Rosenthal. I live on Walnut Street, number 62 in Arlington. Um, <clears throat> I've got two comments I wanna make. Number one is I'm here to speak out against the proposed articles 18 and 19. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much uh, detail. I think other people have uh, explained the downsides of, you know, of those uh, pretty effectively. Um, but I do want to relate uh, a couple of uh, personal experiences um, with regard to what actually uh, the, you know, with regard to uh, what's being described as uh, Arlington uh, racist uh, zoning, because it's not zoning, it's not redlining. Uh, as far as redlining, um, I grew up in a red line neighborhood in Philadelphia. It was 99% Jewish because the, um, the people who built the, you know, who built the neighborhood and made lots of money off it, uh, basically it was treated as a poor neighborhood and, uh, you know, and it was one of the, you know, it was effectively a red line neighborhood. Uh, more importantly, I personally, when I first moved to Arlington, when I first moved to the Boston area was in the uh, 70s and realtors for better or worse have a bad habit of shooting their mouths off when they should keep their mouths shut. And so as one realtor was driving me and a friend around Arlington uh, to show us some apartments, she turned to me and commented, you know, you're lucky you're looking now. Five years ago, they wouldn't have let you in because you're Jewish. About 10 years later, um, I had another experience where I was looking to, uh, to rent a place. And I was remembering uh, that years before there had been an issue where uh, towns were not allowing uh, 
had put had put some restrictions on how many unrelated people could live in in a house, basically to get rid of students. Um, and cohabitation was not approved of then. And so I asked the the realtor a question. Uh, you know, is is the landlord going to have a problem with the fact that my girlfriend and I aren't married? And the realtor turned to us and, without even blushing, said, "Oh no, the landlord will be just ha will just be happy you're white." The racism that exists in Arlington exists as a result of racist realtors and racist landlords. It has nothing whatsoever to do with zoning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be John Warden. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm not, I just want to say we're getting an echo from our other machine because I, I, can't, I can't hear you on my machine, but I can hear it on the other one. The echo's um, gone. We're, we're good now. Thank you. All right. But you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Oh, we good. Can. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, all right. I just, I just want to say two things. One, Arlington used to be a town where, where, where people who didn't have a lot of money could come and buy a single family house at a reasonable price. Uh, those days seem to have gone away uh, because the prices are no longer reasonable. If there is a reasonably priced house around, the realtors immediately call up their, their, their favorite developer and say, here, here, here's one you can get for cheap and the developer rushes in, makes an offer. The realtor says to the sellers, you'll never get a better offer, grab it now. Uh, the, the, two weeks later, the bulldozers arrive and, and that uh, affordable house is gone and it's replaced by some million dollar or million plus dollar house that's spoken of. So th that, th that uh, attraction uh, to Arlington, uh, we, we don't have it anymore. And you're not gonna get it by squeezing a lot more houses in um, unless you squeeze in so many that it makes the town so undesirable that people move out. Poor people who can't afford the tax maybe go to Woburn, say, or Billerica. People who have, have fat salaries may go to some other more Tony suburb like Dedham, for example. Um, but, and, and, and people who want to stick it out, we're going to be stuck. But so, but I think the main point of these articles is, and I talk about 18 and 19. Um, as some speakers have, 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 have mentioned before, these are fundamental changes. These are perhaps the biggest changes to zoning that have ever happened in Arlington for 96 years since we first adopted zoning. The, the, there, there should, they, should not come, they should not come before the town meeting. In this pandemic town meeting, we don't even know how that's gonna work. Nobody knows about this stuff. The, the notice, the notice of zoning map changes, which you claim doesn't need to be made because of, I don't know, some specious argument. You change R, R1 and R0 into R2 and it's not a map change. I don't know if that isn't a map change. I don't know what is. But, but the main thing is if, you, if you're in love with these articles, which I hope you're not, but if you are, put them off until we can have a real town meeting, we can have real hearings, we can have real information going out to all the owners of these, these properties and all the people of Arlington so we, so you, we can have a consensus about what's needed, not, not, not just what a few fanatics and a lot of developers would like to see to trash our town. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Winnell Evans. Thank you. Winnell Evans, Orchard Place. Um, I live in an 850 square foot house in an R2 zone, two houses from me that abruptly jumps to an R6 zone. I'm surrounded by a classic Arlington potpourri of zoning districts, um, fairly, fairly dense, love my neighborhood, love my neighbors. I moved here about 20 years ago. Um, I always tell people I grabbed the bottom rung of the ladder before it was yanked forever out of reach. I have great empathy for people who want to move here and cannot. 
but by simply allowing more houses to be built, we will not be doing anything to help those people. The research into density is changing dramatically. It's not unlike, you know, people used to not really know what smoking did to you, but the research changed and we came to realize how dangerous it was. The research on density is changing. And what the most current research shows is that increased density, unless it specifically requires affordable housing, does nothing to make more affordable housing. The idea that by allowing more market rate units, there will be a trickle down effect is not true. What it actually does is raise is, I'm sorry, lower prices at the very top tiers of housing because that's what is provided. It does nothing to help people in lower or middle income groups, which unfortunately to this day also happens to mainly include black and other minority uh, residents. So to Mr. Palmer and to the gentleman who spoke with the name Stacy Slate, simply by allowing density, we are not doing anything to make our town more diverse. If anything, we will only be making it more homogenous. The average price of new homes now is pushing $1 million. There are very, very few black minority and lower income people who will ever be able to afford those kinds of prices. So it's a, it's a false logic to believe that increasing supply is going to somehow or another bring more diverse people into town. Um, I would also like to agree with the other speakers who have said it is, it's really a travesty to bring this before town meeting this year. Uh, this has not been publicized. Uh, so far, we've had approximately 40 people per Zoom call on this. There are 40,000 people living in Arlington. Uh, unless this is much, much more well publicized, which there's not time to do, so that there can be public discussion about this, it is really a travesty to bring it before special town meeting where floor debate will be weird, truncated, and extremely limited. So I hope that the board will vote not to advance this to special town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Nora Mann. Thank you. Um, so I have lived in Arlington for almost 30 years, and I spent about 10 or 12 of them as a member of the redevelopment board. And I have um, observed this process with interest. Um, it has, I think that the discussion has been fascinating um, and the way it has been moderated has really been um, incredibly helpful in terms of allowing us to really understand the variety of opinions. I am here to say that I support this and I look forward to an affirmative vote by the board so that we can have a discussion at the uh, at town meeting. I think we don't have the option of staying still here in Arlington. If we do nothing, we continue um, the trends of losing generational and economic diversity. We have a housing diversity, a housing affordability crisis that is um, um, in the whole metropolitan area. And we can't just say that other communities are going to do it for us. Um, I, I, I think that um, this, is not, this is not a question of, um, of solving the affordability issue using this particular um, um, strategy. It's about um, starting to move toward a more diverse and accessible housing stock. Um, and um, I look forward to an affirmative vote of the redevelopment board. I would uh, ask for that vote and I look forward to continuing discussion at town meeting. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, could I just ask you uh, to restate your address for the record? We didn't catch it for the notes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm at, at 45 Wollaston Avenue. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker uh, this evening will be Grant Cook. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, I'm Grant Cook. I am at 16 Wollaston Avenue. 
And um, I, I, one of the wisest things I heard in the discussions and the housing forum we had in the summer is that this town needs both. Uh, we need, we're gonna have market rate housing and we're gonna have um, affordable housing. You can't have one without the other. That my fear is that the talk about all affordable, which sounds nice, is a, is a poison pill because we, we're not gonna raise our own property taxes to, to build all affordable, it just becomes another impediment. But this question has been on the table for years. ADA, ADUs were talked about last year, and I remember they were pushed off with talk. We need more time. We need a few more months just to work the issue. Well, here it is again, and we're hearing the same thing. Um, what happened? What, what happened with the time you had? Um, we hear talk about, I'm not aware of the issue. Well, if you weren't aware of these issues for the past months, they've been sitting, this town meeting itself was delayed um, a few months from the normal activities in the spring. Um, if you weren't aware of this issue for the past year, where, where have you been? How do we know that you'll dive into it in the next few months if more time is given? I elected 12 members of my precinct to town meeting. I trust them. I know a lot of them. They're good people. They sit among 252 that I also know many of them. I want to hear what they have to say about this. I want to hear the debate. I want to hear the opponents stand up and, and talk about everything in Arlington with housing is just peachy and the people in Mattapan and and Worcester and Brockton, they don't need to come here. I, I'm gonna hear those words. And if, if town meeting, if the people I trust get up there and say the town isn't ready for this and they vote, then, then, then that's the way the legislature works. So I say bring this forward. Let, let's have this debate and not hide from it for another year. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Joanne Preston. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. I hardly know where to begin. Um, maybe I'll start with all this wonderful diversity. Your, your name and address for the record. Oh, sorry. Joanne Preston. I live in, I live on Mystic Lake Drive, which is in the Webb Cowett neighborhood. We have, as I said before, seven teardowns of beautiful houses, single family houses of various architectural styles. And they've all been replaced with cookie cutter, um, townhouse duplex houses that look all alike. So I don't see where all this diversity is coming from. Um, secondly, what has been put out there, I guess on the internet is that um, that if houses cost less to build, there's, which one speaker said, therefore they will sell for less money. That's absolutely not true. That's um, the wrong way of thinking about economics. Houses will sell what the market will bear. They will get as much money as they can for them. Uh, thirdly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the issue of racism. I thought there was very good data shown that Arlington did not have racist zoning. And I think that's important to keep in mind. What we might have last year if it hadn't been defeated is the changes in zoning came in along Mass Ave, Summer Street, Broadway, with a lot of very modest apartment buildings, which has a lot of diversity in it. So, Basically, these people would be zoned out in, in exchange for luxury condo and apartment buildings. Uh, fourthly, if I have a minute, um, I want to also talk about the issue of racism because not all Blacks are desperately poor. We have a turnover of about, about a thousand units a year, rental and for sale. Even so, over the years, we've had no appreciable increase in Black people moving to Arlington. That leads us to think of the possibility, there are reasons that people don't want to move to Arlington, Black people. Um, and if you listen to the town forums, there was a discussion by a number of respondents who were Black saying they thought that there were problems in the school system with race and that they felt that the real estate industry discriminated 
against selling or renting to black people. Thank you. I'm finished. Thank you. I made it. <laughs> uh, the next uh, person to speak will be Steve Revelack. Uh, sorry, I was just having a moment of difficulty getting my fingers on the right keys. No problem. So my name is Steve Revelack and I live at 111 Sunnyside Avenue. 111 Sunnyside Avenue, which is to say it's a, it is a market rate duplex that was built by a developer in, I think, 1947. Um, you know, part of a, for a development that contained 42 duplexes, 84 units in all told. Basically identical for, floor plan, just, you know, get a bunch of land, put down a road, put down some utilities and build a bunch of them. Which is to say that, you know, I would have a house because someone back in the 1940s was willing to let it happen. And because, and, you know, through, through having that, um, I, and I think six or seven other homeowners before me have had this uh, address as a place to live. So I just hope that, you know, one of, I would just like to point out that folks who are living here now, odds are that you're, you're benefiting from a place that was built by a developer, benefiting from those who allowed the development to take place. And I would like to think that we could be, uh, that we would be willing to pay that forward. Uh, and that's all I have. And yeah, that, that's all I have. And I do support uh, the support 18 and 19. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see we have a speaker who wishes to speak again. Um, do we have any other new speakers before I um, jump to uh, speakers who are speaking for a second time? Okay, I'll go to uh, Judith Garber. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I would like to say this is my first meeting on the um, to listen to the planning board. And I found this very interesting and I would love to hear more discussion about this happen at the town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next we will have uh, Marina Papova. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so again, I'm at 255 Ridge Street uh, in Arlington. Uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, reply to some of the um, speakers that we had before. Uh, first of all, I'm kind of very offended that you know those those people who think that I'm a racist because I uh, I'm against the Article 18, 19, and 16. Uh, I have to give you an example. You know, if I wanted to buy, for example, an apartment in New York City, and that apartment would cost $5 million and I would not be able to afford it, would I have to then sue or uh, maybe, you know, accuse the owners of that building, you know, that they were racist towards me because potentially my, uh, you know, uh, origin is from Russia or from somewhere else, right? No, that's not the case, you know? Uh, Anybody can apply and try to buy the property that opens up and is available. There is no racism here in the actual, you know, uh, ability or you know the uh, desire to buy something. Nobody prevents anyone. Black people, based on their race, based on their religion, based on any other, you know, gender or whatever other, uh, you know, uh, features. Nobody is prevented from trying to buy an apartment or a house or whatever they like. But that's the whole point. You are trying to buy something that you actually personally like, right? I mean, if I like something, but I cannot afford it and I'm not gonna buy it. If I see something that I really like, I'm going to buy it. So that's one point that I wanted to make. Another one again is when you are always saying that a few people were saying that they want to uh, increase the diversity and the affordability. Why are you saying this? You know that the houses that will be built on top of their, uh, those that are teared down, you know that those houses will cost much more than the previous house would have been, right? It's not going to be any more affordable than you know any house that was before. It actually will be much more expensive. So I want us to kind of start really thinking about that and understand that saying that we want to you know, improve the affordability, it's actually a lie. It's not the affordability that what we are improving. Then another person said that we all benefited from the developers building something for us before. 
again, believe that believe us that it's not that we benefited from that. They benefited from taking a lot of money from us when we were paying for that house at the price that they asked us, right? I mean, so again, the benefit, of course, was mutual because we wanted to get the house, we bought it, but the actual, you know, profit was made by, you know, developer because they've got much more profit based than what they spent on building those houses. So that's all that I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be, uh, it's a phone number ending in 428. Hi, this is Elizabeth Gray, Town Meeting Member, um, Jason Street. Yeah, I just also wanted to respond to a few things. Um, I take issue with the gentleman who says that we weren't paying attention since March. So we really don't have any business to be paying attention now and asking for more time. I mean, we are in the middle of a pandemic and uh, that gentleman has no idea what each of us are facing. And so that's really the issue. We are in a pandemic and there is no need to push this through to a virtual town meeting that has never happened before. There's no idea what kind of debate we'll be able to have during that meeting. There is no reason we can't wait a couple more months until our next scheduled town meeting in 2021. There is no reason to push this through. And I would also like to just um, piggyback on what Joanne Preston said. If families of color wanted to move here and can afford it, then they would. But Arlington has a reputation among people of color that it is not a welcoming place. If you go back to the community conversation that was uh, held about housing, no one seems to be, remember the comment made by one of the listeners saying that they knew a family of color who could afford a home in Arlington, but was not looking to move into Arlington because Arlington is not a welcoming place. If you look at our schools, if you look at what's going on in our police department, there is a lot to be done in Arlington beyond housing to make people want to move here and stay here and raise a family here. So there is just no need to get this done now. I ask you to wait. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Michael Basham. Hi there. Uh, my name is Michael Bastian. I live at 73 Randolph Street. Um, just very quickly, I want to say that I support Article 18 and 19 because I believe that there is a housing crisis in the Boston area, and the only way we can fix it is by increasing supply. I know that Arlington alone cannot fix this issue, but we need to be a good influence on other communities and do our part to ameliorate it. Um, I would also just like to add as a relative newcomer to Arlington that I've really enjoyed my time here, but I do want the town to change, and I think um, by increasing supply and allowing more people to move here, I think it can go in a better direction. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak in open forum? Seeing none, we will now close the uh, public, the uh, open forum for the uh, six warrant articles, which we have uh, heard over the last three nights. And we will move to the individual discussion by the board of the six articles um, and uh, the portion of the meeting where we will also vote on whether to take action or no action on each of the articles. Um, let's see, so Jenny um, or Aaron, Jenny, I'm not sure if you're going to switch to Aaron. Um, I was going to switch to Aaron. I was going to ask Aaron to pull up the document um, and go from there. Great. Yes, just bear with me. Sure. Jenny, the word document, correct? Yep, it would be great yes. to see the list of the, of the articles themselves. There we go. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. So if we could go to the list, perfect. Um, so I'd like to suggest to the board that we run through these in order, um, starting with Article 16. Um, we'll take discussion and um, then uh, vote on them uh, 
at the conclusion of, of the discussion of each one of the articles. Unless there are any objections, any comments on that procedurally? Great. Uh, well, let's start with Article 16. And I will uh, first open it up uh, for David. Oh, just um, reiterating my, my previous thoughts on this. Um, as it's currently worded, I'm, I'm not supportive of, of this article. I think the, the intention was to draw a distinction between public and private open space. Um, and I do think there is confusion um, in, in the public um, in that context, but I, I don't think that the proposed language um, really solves that problem and uh, perhaps introduces other issues, um, particularly where um, the uh, open space terminology uh, is widely used as a term of art um, in, in many other communities. And uh, we would be using um, significantly different terminology here. Um, I also have the concern uh, about whether any changes made in uh, in uh, section two um, uh, would be able to be appropriately changed in the rest of, of the bylaw within the scope of, of this Warren article. Uh, but my primary my primary issue here is is the wording as it's proposed. If we want to try to tinker with the wording, and we're confident that, uh, and as as well as go through and make any other needed changes uh, to the other sections of the bylaw to comport with with the change definitions, uh, and we're confident that that would be within scope, I'd be okay going through that exercise. But uh, as it stands, I would not vote in favor of this. David, I'll go next to Ken. Um, I too concur with David. Um, as written, um, I don't support this at all. I, I think this, uh, the, um, uh, the intent was, was good, but changing just the word open space is not, is too confusing. And it's, it's something that's been, uh, everybody, everybody understands uh, from town to town and it, it goes throughout all the zoning. So um, I, I would like to um, propose that we uh, table this uh, and maybe uh, approach this maybe next year for this one here, such that uh, we go through the whole zoning and, and fed it out maybe with, it, with uh, not changing the words, but maybe adding a description that better describes it so it's less confusing. Um, that'd be my... Um, opinion on this on this article 16. Thank you, Ken. Uh, go next to Jean. Thank you. Um, I think that the intention of the um, people who presented this was not to somehow undermine the open space requirements in town in any way, but simply to make a distinction between what's thought of as open space like parks and things like that and open space that's on somebody's property. I think unfortunately the wording that they use, yard space, secondary, primary is not the wording we would want to use. And we had this discussion when this first came up. I think if we would not change the term open space to yard space, but just instead term it private open space. So there'd be private open space, private open space landscape and private open space usable, we would accomplish what the people who presented the article intended to accomplish. And then, you know, I have to thank the staff for, for going through the bylaws and attempting to find every instance 
in which the term open space is used. And they would have to do that again. And, and on my idea, change it to private open space, one or the other. So I guess we could make that change, get rid of the what I think is the unfortunate wording that was chosen, understand what I think was the good intention of the people who put this in, change the wording to private open space as I suggested. And I think it should be very non-controversial to present it. And then it's really, um, do we present it? Do we give um, a report recommending it to town meeting or do we give a report of no action because we don't wanna change um, the wording? I'd be more inclined to try to accomplish what I think were the good intentions of the people who put it in, but not use their wording. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Katie. Uh, David, I'll come back to you after we have Katie's thoughts. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm happy to let David go first if he has something that quickly follows on what Jean said. So oh. I don't wanna interrupt the, the flow. Thank you, Katie. David? Yeah, I, I did just wanna follow up on, on what Jean was saying about just uh, about using the term private open space and then replacing the instances throughout the zoning bylaw of, of open space with private open space. But I, I think the issue with that is we'd need to go through with a finer tooth comb because there are also references to what we are talking about as public open space in, in the bylaw, I believe. There, um, I look very few. Um, but we would have to get that right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes. With, no matter how many there are, uh, so it's not it's not quite as simple as as just a search and replace. It's right. a good point. Thank you, David. Uh, Katie. Um, so I just want to say I completely agree with my fellow board members. Um, I think the intention of this article was really good. I don't think there's any of these sort of insidious, darker aims about undermining our town's um, open space. Um, or green space or anything else um, that's been implied. But I, um, I also agree that given that open space is used by the surrounding communities, it's, it's a clear, um, easy to understand piece of language. I don't think that this particular change um, is the right one. So I would support, uh, I think as the other board members said, tabling this so we can get the wording right. Um, but the intention of it, I think, is something uh, good and something we should keep thinking about. Great, thank you. And I agree as well. Um, so do we hear a um, specific motion on, on this particular uh, article then? Um, did someone, would someone like to make a- A motion a, of a, a no action article 16 as presented. Second. Second. Okay, I will take a roll call vote. Uh, for the motion for no action, uh, starting with Ken. Aye. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am also a yes. Okay, so that closes Article 16. And we will now move to Article 17 which is the uh, zoning bylaw amendment, notice of demolition, open foundation, excavation, new construction, or large additions with the reference to the uh, so-called good neighbor act in the town bylaws. And we will start with, um, we will start with uh, Jean on this one. I, you know, as we, as I mentioned, um, the last time. I, I think there's nothing wrong with adding this sentence. I think it's completely unnecessary because there are other places um, in the bylaws that um, um, require this. And same thing with Title VI, Article Seven. We heard what some of what the people who submitted the article said and what um, some other people said, 
that there seem to be some problems with the implementation of Title VI, Article Seven, And I really took a close look at that. And I really think the fix is not adding this sentence, but having the same um, people who submitted this, taking a look and making some changes to Title VI, Article Seven and I'd be happy to discuss with them what they have in mind to take to town meeting next year. So I'm not opposed to this. Um, I just think it's unnecessary. And I think the fix is some tweaks to Title VI, Article Seven. Thank you. Uh, go next to David. Well, I, I have a question for Jean. Um, I thought when we first looked at this, you had expressed some possible concern with whether the proposed language might somehow um, have unintended consequences and perhaps broaden the application of Title VI, Article Seven beyond what is, is stated in that article. Um, and I, I've been I've been looking at it from that perspective, and um, I'm I'm not sure uh, because I I think the language of this section um, uh, three point one section uh, section B does not exactly track uh, the language around permits in Title Six Article Seven. Um, so it's not simply a reiteration, and I'm I'm, I'm struggling with the um, possibility that this might provide a hook to apply Title VI, Article Seven, in situations where it might not actually be applicable uh, uh, otherwise today. Um, but that being said, I also do not feel that this is necessary um, and that if there is a problem with the uh, um, application and enforcement of Title VI, Article Seven, that uh, that is, is where the proponent's attention should be rather than uh, putting cross-reference in here. If I can just respond yes. Did you briefly to David. I think one of, one of the problems with the wording here is that um, no permit says no permit shall be issued until the applicant's in compliance. But so in, in the cases where the applicant has not given prior notice and that's the requirement, the applicant can't go on a time machine and go back in time to give that prior notice. So it's technically not really great wording because of that problem with when things have to happen under Title VI, Article Seven, That's why I really think the fix is some wording changes to Title VI, Article Seven, and this might create a little mischief. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm also, I'm also thinking it says the building, until the building inspector finds. So does that mean that the building inspector can't just simply issue a permit, but has to make a finding of compliance separate from issuing a permit. I, I, I'm a little confused by this. Uh, and I, I think it opens up the, uh, it, it does not clarify the process. I, I think it might bring additional confusion. Uh, Ken? I concur with my uh, other board members. Um, I think this adds one more layer uh, of something that's not not necessarily uh, needs to be required. I think it's covered in other areas, and this is just piling on more regulations, making it more difficult uh, for someone who wants to do something. And uh, that's I think that could be construed as a un, uh, a consequence of this. And we're trying to make things simpler, more friendlier for people who want to, uh, to do an addition or do something. And 
you were just adding one more regulation on top of it. Um, I think we can clarify it in, a, like Jean said, uh, in the Good Neighbor Act and leave it at that and not have another regulation on top of that one. So I'm not supportive of this at all. Thank you, uh, Katie. I um, agree with my fellow board members and I think Ken stated this perfectly. Um, we don't need to add in more regulations where it's not necessary um, to do so. Uh, thank you. I, I actually agree, Jean. I think that there, if there is a problem with enforcement that changing it, your suggestion of, of um, working with the um, petitioner to identify the places in the town bylaws where that needs to be clarified or strengthened is probably the, the right way to go as opposed to trying to insert it into the, um, the zoning bylaws um, instead with questionable wording. Yeah, can so, I just give one little please. example? I, I looked at this, I forgot and came back. Title six, article seven requires a notice plus a lot of materials to the surrounding property owners, but it only requires one thing to go to the building inspector from the developer. So there's really a mismatch in Title VI, Article Seven between what the building inspector gets and what's required of the developer, at least as how I read it. And that was just one thing that occurred to me the first time I read through it. And I think there are two or three other things that can be strengthened that shouldn't be a problem. Great. Any other comments or um, discussion on, on this article before we look for a motion? Seeing none, um, do we have a, um, a motion or uh, action or no action on this article? Motion of no action on article 17 as written. Thank you, is there a second? All second. Thank you. I'll run through the roll call uh, for a uh, vote, uh, starting with Ken. Uh, yes. David. Yes. Jean. Yes. Katie. Yes. And I am also a yes. So article 17, uh, we will recommend no action. Uh, moving to the next article, which is Article 18, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Improving Residential Inclusiveness, Sustainability, and Affordability by Ending Single Family Zoning. And this time we will start with David. Well, let me start by saying that I think that um, the issues that uh, this article um, attempts to, to get at underlying single family zoning are important issues uh, and ones that we should um, uh, spend time um, understanding and, and trying to correct. That being said, um, I um, I'm not supportive of moving forward with this article at this time. The re reason for that goes back to a uh, town meeting in uh, 2019. And the confusion surrounding the zoning proposals uh, at that time, uh, despite a significant effort by the board and, and the planning department uh, to do public outreach uh, on those proposals. And following that, uh, the board committed to um, a public engagement process and to engaging uh, with the select board on a larger discussion of our housing uh, issues and affordability issues. And that um, that process is still ongoing. Uh, and uh, as Rachel noted before, we, the, the ARB, have uh, not 
put forward any uh, pro proposed substantive changes in, in the zoning aside from the, the uh, parking related one that we'll, we'll get to in a bit. Um, uh, pending the outcome of, of that public process. And uh, I um, am not comfortable moving forward with this, uh, which would be uh, in many ways a much more significant change in zoning than anything we even proposed last year without um, both completing the process that we have been engaged in uh, and uh, for a proposal of this magnitude uh, doing very significant public outreach and education um, prior to bringing it to town meeting. So that's, that's where I stand on this at this point. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll go next to uh, Ken. Well, I think this article, I will differ from my uh, uh, other board member, David. Um, I am supportive of this um, for the following reasons. I think this brings up good issues to, uh, to talk about. And I think it's, it's, it's a very broad issue that's larger than just us five. And I'd be very interested to see what the town meeting members have to say about this. And it's not us to decide, is this going to happen or not? Um, I think we should give the opportunity for the town meeting members to actually weigh in and see what their thoughts are on this. And um, so I, I was on the fence, but, uh, but after hearing all the comments um, so far, I, I think uh, it's worth um, bringing it out there so that it could be um, this issue can be brought up more and discussed in a larger form. And that's what I'm um, voting. I would vote for this. Thank you, Ken. Um, move next to Jean. Uh, thank you. So I'm a little torn about this for, for some of the reasons that uh, David had mentioned. You know, we on the redevelopment board had decided after town meeting last year that we would want to have a very robust public process about housing in the, in the town and what could happen. And um, the pandemic, um, among other reasons, didn't allow us to do that. And we hadn't intended to bring something to town meeting until um, maybe next year or the year after at the earliest to give enough time for that to all happen. On the other hand, this is not our article. This article was put in by you know, one person and 10 registered voters. And so I look at it a little bit of a different way and a little bit more the way uh, Ken is looking at it, which is, is it our job to say, no, we don't want town meeting to have a chance to discuss it because we weren't ready to present a housing proposal to town meeting? Or do we say, let's hear what town meeting has to say about this? So let me say what I've been thinking about that. You know, a number of people tonight and the other night said, well, a lot of people in town don't know about this. But I sort of feel a lot of people in town will know about this if it goes to town meeting. And we got a wide variety of opinions from the people who spoke um, both days. So I think we have a flavor to um, what people are thinking on both sides. Um, I, there was some discussion about don't bring it to town meeting next month because you know it's gonna be some sort of Zoom or different sort of town meeting and not sort of the standard town meeting. I think the conversations tonight and the other nights are examples that this process that we're using also works really well. People are able to say what they wanna say and be heard and have some um, no different in a lot of ways than the standard town meeting 
before the pandemic. So I'm really not concerned that we're putting some sort of unusual burden on town meeting members if they have to discuss this at town meeting um, next month. Now let me get to the substance of this. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the substance, but there are three things that I would want to change in this for me to support it. Let me say what they are. Number one, oh, let me say something else first. A lot of things were said over the course of a couple of nights about, you know, developers are tearing down older homes, single family homes in R2 districts, and then they're building duplexes in the R2 districts that sell for more money than the single family homes. In this case, though, we're talking about the R0 and the R1 districts, and at least during my walks during the pandemic and before, what I've seen in at least my neighborhood and some other neighborhoods is that the developers, maybe they're the same ones or not, are buying single family homes in these areas. They're tearing them down and they're building newer, larger single family homes to the maximum size that they're allowed to fit on the lot under zoning. So there's a recent one a few blocks where I live where they bought a house for about $800,000. And I was shocked to walk by sometime after that. And they see the house completely torn down. And now there's a much bigger house on it. Don't like the way it looks particularly that I think just sold for about two and a half million dollars. So by doing nothing, we are not stopping that sort of thing from happening. What I, what I think would be interesting is if this did go into effect, each one of those builders would then decide, am I gonna build that one family house that I could have built anyway on the property? Or am I gonna build a two family dwelling or a duplex on the property instead. And obviously they'll do whatever they think can get the best return on their investment. And I think one of the proponents mentioned this, if they end up building a duplex, each side will probably cost less than if they had built one big single family home. We're not building affordable housing. That's not gonna be affordable housing. No affordable housing without deep subsidies gets built in Arlington now because of the cost of land, cost of construction, et cetera. So this article is not going to stop the transformation of the R0, the R1, or the multifamily zones from the market forces that are taking place. That said, if we were to do this, if we were to send it to town meeting, I would like to send it to town meeting with three amendments to it. Number one, and I need the help, especially from the two architects on the board to think about this. Number one, I would like there to be a requirement that either the two family or the duplex have the appearance of a single family home. And I think we can talk a little bit about some language that might help make that happen because one of the um, complaints we heard had to do with the appearance of the neighborhood. Second had to do with density, but under this proposal, those duplexes or two family homes will be no larger than what they're allowed to build for a single family home. So it's the look, single family home look. Second, what I don't wanna have to see if this happens is something with like four bay car garages. And you know, the garage is stuck right out sort of as far as they can toward the sidewalk, sort of snout houses, so that when you walk down the sidewalk, you're not greeted by the house, you're greeted by the garage. So that's unfortunately starting to happen already in town. I think partially an unintended consequence of make it more difficult for people to put garages under houses. 
So I think we would have to think about how to craft something so that what the house doesn't present to the street is a large bay of garages. Now I know that's intended for the residential design guidelines, but those are only guidelines. I think these should be required if developers are going to do this. Third thing. And Ken, by the way, I see you. I'll let Jean finish all three and then come back to you. I have thoughts Thank as you. well. <laughs> third, third thing. Um, so this gives developers in the R0 and R1 um, zones a choice. Are they going to tear down what they would have torn down anyhow and build a big single family home, or are they going to build a duplex or two family? They're going to build a duplex or two family if they have a greater return on their investment. Now, back when I was in law school many, many, many decades ago, one of the things my property professor mentioned, which I still remember, is when you change zoning, or when you do some other things um, in a community, what you effectively often do is raise the value of some property and lower the value of some other property. So by doing this, we theoretically raise the possibility that developers can get a larger return on investment if they determine that the market can, they can sell a duplex or two family home. The question is, how can the town capture back part of that um, increase in wealth? How can we share that? And to me, the way to share it is to amend um, Article 8, Section 8.2, I think is the one, on affordable housing, so that if a developer chooses to build a two unit, where they could build a one in the R0 and R1, it is their choice, they have to pay a fee to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I'm not sure how much the fee should be, and I think we would have to sort of do a little quick economics with the, um, with the staff on that, but the fee should probably be based on the assessed value or the selling value and two or 3% of that, because then if the developer chooses to build a two unit building, the town shares some of that and it goes toward affordable housing in town. So I would support this going to the town meeting so that the town meeting can have a real discussion about this with those three amendments. That's it. Thank you, Jean. I'll um, go to Ken to respond specifically to the um, points that, that Jean just brought up um, before going to Katie. Uh, Jean, some of the things you, uh, you asked for is somewhat subjective. Um, and you, and I, I'm not sure how, you, how we can craft regulations for that. Uh, but how I read this article, um, and I thought my understanding was that it doesn't change any of the setback requirements for single family. It would have to meet all the requirements for, for single family. And that goes with driveways, it goes with shadow studies, it goes with front yard, side yard setbacks, it goes with trees, everything. So I think that sort of answers some of the questions you had there. Uh, what you bring up about um, a um, a fee for this is intriguing, and I, I think I would support that too. I think having a, a nominal fee of maybe four or five percent uh, for this, and for this, but for this fund to go into a housing fund, not to the general tax fund. No, the affordable go, housing trust. It has to go to a housing fund, yep. uh, which then could develop more affordable housing because. The only way you get affordable housing is by government taxes, but no one's going to build it because you say you want it. So by funding that, I think that's a great idea. It's a win-win. I mean, you can't do it in such a way where it, the incentive is, doesn't make sense anymore, but uh, it's, it's a good encouragement. And I think it's, uh, I, I would support what you said there. Well, uh, I, 
Thank you. And I'd, I'd be willing if you were willing to give me a couple of days to try to draft something to try to scope out what the um, what the um, appearance of a single family home might look like in regulations or in the bylaws. Sure, I, I'd be willing to help you out with that if you need. Terrific. So let's let's go next to to Katie, and then we'll um, then I had some thoughts, and we'll circle back around to to that discussion. Um, so thank you, yeah, to the board members. These are all really great comments, and I really like Jean's idea of a B, um, in part because you know, as um, you know, Ken raised, we're not going to get affordable housing through zoning. Um, that's just the reality of land costs, construction costs, everything else in a town like Arlington. We need deep subsidies from federal, state government um, to get that done, given how cash-strapped our local governments are right now. Um, and so I think the idea of a fee um, for this kind of development is really appealing. Um, and I'd also be interested to see some of the language you guys come up with around sort of what the appearance of these um, two family homes might look like. Um, but I wanna speak more generally um, about sort of both process and the substance of um, this article. And so process wise, I can think of nothing more democratic than bringing this before town meeting rather than having this discussed just by the five of us and by the 40 to 50 people who came to these rooms. Um, we elected a legislative body in this town that represents our interests. And I would love to hear what they have to say about this article. Um, I strongly um, reject the idea that a Zoom town meeting will be incapable of having these discussions. We've had them effectively here in this room. Um, and I've actually done analyses. Um, one of the things that I've been working on with some of my colleagues at Boston University is actually empirically with data looking at what the dynamics of these Zoom hearings are like and how different they are from planning and zoning board meetings before the Zoom era. And it turns out they're remarkably similar. The same people are showing up demographically. We sort of rigorously look at this and the demographic disparities, which is maybe a little depressing when we think about um, representational inequality, they're quite similar and their support or opposition to housing is also quite similar. And so something is lost in Zoom, certainly, you know, to some, you know, I'd love to see everyone's faces and be in the same room, but I think we can have high quality discussions about housing and I would love to see our elected representatives have those discussions. Um, so now to the substance um, and sort of why I support this article. I think um, tonight, a lot of the convert and in the previous night, a lot of the conversation, I feel a little frustrated by um, the total denial of problems that are facing middle income home buyers who seek market rate housing in Arlington. Um, this is a really big problem. We absolutely have a shortage of affordable housing um, and I support sort of any kind of federal or state subsidies to address this issue, but we also have a real shortage of market rate housing. And we have both data to back this up and there were a lot of anecdotes um, from folks and stories and narratives that I think are really important. I actually found myself this um, past spring in the unfortunate position of being in the Arlington housing market um, to find housing for my parents to be close by. And it is terrible. And I, I want that to really come across. Um, we heard from a few more recent home buyers in Arlington. I looked at single family homes where one literally had dead mice all over the basement floor and it sold um, for between 900,000 and a million dollars. Um, so the single family market was brutal. And where how this relates to condos, after losing out on multiple single family housing bids, my parents decided, oh, can you check out this condo for us that's close by to you? The condo, as condos are, was about $200,000 cheaper than surrounding single family homes. Um, it was comfortable for my parents and they were able to get into the Arlington housing market because there was a two family home with a condominium that was nearby. Um, and so this turns out, this is not just like an anecdote about my own family. This turns out to be a broader pattern. The um, planning board actually provided really helpful data that's publicly posted on the ARB um, page that shows that yes, these new condos being built are more expensive than the old houses that were there, but that's not an apples to apples comparison. The right comparison is to new single family homes and those new duplex condominiums are about 200 to $300,000 cheaper than the new single family homes, depending upon the year that we cut the data. Um, so yes, those new duplexes are not going to make Arlington housing cheap, but they absolutely will help to stem the tide of rapidly increasing housing prices in this community. Um, and so for that reason, I, I really sort of support this article and its intention. I support what Jean has said about how we can potentially modify it. Um, 
to make it more palatable to town meeting, but most importantly, from a process perspective, I would like to see town meeting discuss this because I think that would, to me, again, my view is just of one person. As the commenters who came here tonight, those are 50 people. Let's hear from the representative body of the town of Arlington. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I'll just add that um, I really appreciate all of the people that have joined our meeting in, in the public comment period on both sides of, of this issue and um, also those who, who really expressed an, an interest in or recognized that they had a lot more to, to learn before they identified where they fell on, on this issue too. And I think my biggest concern, I, 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 I think that I fall um, more in line with, with David's thought about the importance of um, really looking to a robust public process that allows the town meeting members to understand what their constituents and um, the people who live in this town truly um, truly think about this and to educate them on, on what this would mean to, to them as the residents of the town. So one of the things, because of how quickly um, the special town meeting is, is coming upon us, um, we don't have the robust series of precinct meetings and, and um, other opportunities for town meeting members to be able to interact with with the residents of the town prior to this special town meeting where I think that engaging in a discussion about this particular article would be really important um, before they are able to effectively represent the, um, the, the members of, of their community. And I, I appreciate the, the three points that, that Jean brought up. Um, I think it becomes very difficult to um, legislate or um, create specific guidelines around a, appearance um, where we don't do that anywhere else in our zoning bylaws. Um, although I share the exact same concerns that, that you do, Jean, about, about appearance and about the way that some of these duplexes and two family homes would change the complexion of um, many of these neighborhoods where historic homes and, and other properties currently currently are um, and and I and I also really appreciate the um, the um, thought that you had about the, uh, the the percentage fee towards the affordable housing trust fund I think it's a really um, really interesting and um, provocative idea and I think that there are many others that could be attached to this should we put this out to a wider study group or um, again, a more robust public process prior to um, the discussion at town meeting so that it, it so that there's a background that allows a much more informed and robust discussion. So um, those are my thoughts and where I'm currently leaning on this. Rachel, um, can I just make a, a comment about the timing um, for substantive substantial changes um, like they're being discussed? Please. Um, we uh, just received notice um, when uh, reports to town meeting and motions are due. So they're due on November 5th and um, your next meeting is on November 2nd when um, the intention was to vote on a report to town meeting. So should those sorts of changes that are being discussed by the ARB members um, be desired to be included, we would need to have that wrapped up on November 2nd. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a tough time period. It is a very tight uh, timeline. But I just I just for uh, re reality sake, I wanted to mention um, the schedule that we are working under um, to be prepared for town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's a it's a really important point you brought up. Thank you, uh, David. I see you have your hand up to speak. Couple of thoughts. Um, I I also. Uh, like the concept of um, of establishing a municipal affordable housing trust and having developers pay into that in, um, in, in this situation. Um, 
but that's exactly the larger discussion that needs to happen. If you look at uh, how this has been done in the few places that have done it so far, Seattle, for instance, there was a very lengthy public process and a lot of compromise um, to put a, a system in place, uh, including uh, payments by developers um, that was acceptable before moving forward with this. Um, you know, I think if we were to make substantial changes to this, then uh, we're, we're effectively making it the board's article. Uh, and, uh, and that I think goes back to my original point of whether or not we uh, should um, be uh, um, keeping faith with the commitment to public process that we made uh, last year uh, on, on the zoning issues. So um, I, I don't, as, as much as I want to dig into this, uh, and I, I also want to say I, I don't think it's undemocratic for us to um, to make a decision one way or the other on this because uh, that's that's our job. We we are we are constituted to be the gatekeepers on zoning issues, um, and um, you know if. Uh, you could make the same argument on basically any citizen driven proposal that comes before us that it should be discussed by town meeting. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know that that's, that's a compelling enough reason. Yes, I think that would, I think it would be a very good discussion, but I'm not sure how we can move this forward now to have this, that discussion without effectively saying we endorsed this despite not having had uh, not having it grow out of the public process that we initiated. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, David, all of the things you said, just a couple sort of thoughts in response. I mean, we had not put in an article like this before and probably would not have done it at the end of the process anyhow. So um, I think putting, putting this forward to town meeting, and I think we could indicate this in the report to town meeting is something that we didn't initiate. Um, but if they were to pass it, here's the language that we think would be appropriate with the additions I suggested and, and say, you know, have at it, town meeting. Um, what do you think? Um, you know, if on, you know, and, and I, I think you're right about um, we are tasked to be gatekeepers, and and um, and an example of the previous two articles where we said no, I think we did the appropriate gatekeeping function. But I think this is a little different because this is a really huge policy issue. It's you know. And on that, maybe our best gatekeeper function is to frame it better and then send it to town meeting for a robust discussion. So how do we frame it other than saying, uh, we recommend approval uh, you know, as, as written with our changes, for, for instance? Dave, I think if we were to do what Gene says, we would have to put in a supplementary um, uh, warrant article that modifies this one. Is that correct, Gene? No, we would no. just we would just modify this one, and, and what would go in was not was this one with the modification as modified. But our recommendation would have to be uh, to approve it as modified. Right, we would recommend to approve it to modify, and I think, well, we might want to check and then say, you know, and, and um, something about for, you know, town meeting discussion or something. Well, but you're right, David. I mean, we do have to recommend, you know, either no action or approval. 
and it could be approval with the modifications we've suggested. Yeah, I, unless what if the, I, what I, if I the proponent th wants to do something else and doesn't want our modifications? Then they have to put in a substitute motion at town meeting. So they would have to do the substitute motion. They would motion. have to do the substitute motion. Okay. To substitute and they would have to do that by next Wednesday. And if we voted no action, they could do a substitute motion that looks exactly like this. And I guess I would rather have something go to town meeting with the amended version rather than their version. But Jean, wouldn't you want time to to really craft that amended version? I, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the, the three items that you brought up especially the first two, that's a significant amount of work, I think, in order to get to something that would, would be meaningful enough that would change this to address the, the points that, that you made. And to, to be quite honest, I, again, to, to Katie's point, I'm, I'm not concerned about this being over a Zoom meeting. I, I completely agree that I think that the ability to have public discourse over a Zoom meeting, I, I, I don't, doubt that and we've seen it in action. I, I think that we're rushing because of how quickly, you know, the, the, the open um, period for submission of the articles, the, the hearings, and then moving into the actual town meeting a week and a half from now, we, we just don't have the time to, to make those changes and then to get them to the town meeting members in time for them to prepare to be able to have a substantive conversation about this on the floor, where if we recommended no action and then worked towards um, towards towards moving this conversation forward, when it comes forward again, you're able to do so with you know meaningful visuals, with um, you know having having really looked at the different ways that this affects. Um, the different the different use groups and have the discussion about aesthetics and then all of the other potential um, thoughts that might that might come up. It's it's it it seems pretty pretty loose right now um, to can have I, that kind of substantive discussion. Can I Please. say one more thing, Rachel? Please, Jean. Didn't this article come out of a uh, working group? I don't think so. This wasn't brought up in that um, housing group that Ben and uh, Ben hosts uh, from time to time. Uh, uh, We'd have to ask Steve Revelak, who's here because Ben's not, who's presented on the article. An, not an official study group of the of the town. No, it's, no, not. it's not. But it, but I'm just saying that it wasn't just ten people just saying let's do this. Uh, I thought it. I thought it was developed from um, that uh, citizen group. We'll uh, am I wrong? Can we ask uh, Mr. Revelak this? Hello, Mr. Lowski, Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Could you repeat the question, please? Um, this warrant article, um, article 18, uh, ending of single family zoning, um, was this brought? Uh, through discussions with this um, um, housing group that you guys belong to and and, uh, and discussed amongst you guys and developed over time or is it something that just came up with you and uh, Ben? It was, um, you know, it was something that came up uh, between Mr. Rudick, myself and a couple of people from our group. There were not uh, formal discussions, um, you know, or some, or the process you would typically see in say a town sponsored working group you know you can i would assume that you know this being a resident sponsored petition uh probably has probably evolved like you know most resident sponsored petitions that um you know have for, to change to amend the zoning bylaw which is to say a group of people sees an issue that they need to address and uh, they put forth an idea to address it. Thank you for the clarification. David? I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of deja vu. Um, 
with the discussion of making substantial changes to this citizen proposed article, because that's what we did last year. Um, and uh, it unfortunately ended up adding to the confusion despite our best efforts. And we, we did a lot of community meetings where we actually, uh, along with the planning department, met with citizens and town meeting members. It wasn't just putting it out there and town meeting members discussing it with their constituents. There was a substantial effort um, by us uh, to explain what we were doing and build support for it. Um, and I'm, you know, we're not talking about as substantial a, a shift from the originally proposed article here, but I'm feeling a little bit like that. Um, and I, I think if I, I, I think if our options are, you know, approve it as proposed, approve it as amended, or no action. If we say no action, uh, if um, that does not that does not prevent a substitute motion from being uh, brought, I think uh, that would allow the discussion to happen anyway. And if the important thing is for the discussion to happen, but we don't feel like we can endorse it um, at, at this point, uh, I think that's okay. Gene? Yeah, I guess I just feel like these are not sort of major substantive changes the way we did last year with the article, just requiring some aesthetic values and the um, and the payment to the affordable housing trust fund is not, I think, at all at the same level as what we did last time. I mean, look, to be fair, I would vote no action if we were not to amend it. I think it needs those amendments. Yeah, and, and I'm 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 not. Yeah, I, I'm certainly not comfortable moving forward knowing that we could potentially be affecting property values. And again, we've, we've really not, um, nobody's done the work of, of uh, bringing this more widely to the, to the town itself. It, there, there hasn't been that process ahead of town meeting. Jean? So if we vote no action, then no, um, bylaw like this can go to town meeting for the next two years unless we approve it. So I think maybe if we were to vote no action, we might want to sort of ask the Housing Implementation Plan Committee to take this on as a project so that maybe they could make recommendations along with the other things they're going to be doing over the next year on this so that maybe a year from now we'll decide this isn't viable or a year from now there's something like this that it makes sense to bring to town meeting. Erin, I think you had a clarification to make. Yeah, I was just gonna state exactly what Jean stated. Um, the, redevel <laughs> the redevelopment board um, could uh, recommend action and express interest to refer this to either an existing committee such as the Zoning Bylaw Working Group or the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, combination of the both, or you know, a new committee that could be developed. Um, so, so that's certainly an option in front of you. Um, you know, in addition to the recommendations that were stated um, earlier this evening. Well, can I? Six, six, seven more, uh, Rachel. Please. Um, hearing all the, hearing all this thing, that I think I'd be willing to uh, vote for no action and move it forward to a new study group that's focused solely on this issue here, because I think it's 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 broader than just housing. And I I, I like to keep it that way and just have it. Set, have a new group and then um, do do some public outreach and so forth, and do what Dave said. Let's let's get it out there. 
and maybe bring it back in the spring. So I have a question for you. If it's wider than housing, how would you define, I think we need to define what the group, what the study group would look like. How would you define it? Now, I see Jean has a hand up too. I'm not sure. Um, that's something I, I, I will leave it up to. Um, maybe we could discuss that and see how that, how what people think about that. I just think it just should be not just, uh, um, just someone who's interested in housing. I think it. I think we have to get a realtor, maybe a realtor involved. We have to maybe get a developer involved, um, and you know maybe get a lawyer involved. So so we, you know and get a consensus of of a broader issue. That's you know, but this zoning issue affects that broader. And I think we should, we just have a wider group discuss that. I I just suggest that we if we vote no action, we ask um, the planning department to either give it to one of the two groups if the groups if they think one of the groups is appropriate to take it on, or to create a third committee for the purpose of looking at this. I don't want to sort of dictate which one planning does. Maybe they think the zoning bylaw committee has the time and can bring in some other people or form a subcommittee to take it on. So I like your idea, Kim, but I ask basically Jenny and her staff to figure out what that group looks like that's going to do this. I'm okay with that. David? So could we could we recommend uh, to town meeting that uh, they um, direct the planning department to uh, ref uh, to refer this article to uh, an appropriate committee for study for uh, for potential future action or something to that effect? Dave, I thought we can do that. I think we can do that. Yeah, so we don't have to. Oh, we think, just we just do it without sending it to right. town meeting. You mean? Right. I, Correct. I think we say no action and say we, you know, we have requested the planning department to, you know, either give it to one of its existing committees or create a new committee for the purpose of, you know, exploring this and coming up with a recommendation. I'm okay with that. I'm just I'm just thinking back that I believe some of the other committees uh, have arisen specifically at the direction of town meeting. Right. I, fine, but I think and they could choose to do that anyhow. But I think we could at least get it going. And if they didn't do it, it would be in in you know in motion already. I agree with Jean. Okay. Rachel, yeah. May I um, just clarify what I understand um, the sort of the motions that would be uh, options for the ARB. Um, so uh, you could, um, the ARB could vote to recommend action and express interest in that recommendation that town meeting refer the article to either an existing group or a new group. Um, the ARB could conversely recommend no action. Um, and then a town meeting member would need to file a substitute motion for a town meeting to discuss, which would require a vote of town meeting. And then through that discussion request um, the article to be referred to study, um, which, I, which I think is um, the process that has happened in the past, for example, the residential study group. So in order for us to request um, or recommend the planning department to identify the appropriate committee, we need to actually recommend action with that request as opposed to um, a request to take a, a vote on the particular item. Jean? I don't think so. I think we have to take a vote of either, you know, recommending something to town meeting or recommending no action. It sounds like where we're maybe coalescing, although we haven't heard from Katie yet, is to recommend no action and to ask the planning department to have one of its existing committees or a new committee take this on as a project. Then 
he goes to town meeting with a recommendation of no action. And if a substitute motion is put in by somebody, then we can ask town meeting to also require a committee to look at it. Understood. Katie, any thoughts? Sorry to be on mute. Um, I think on balance, I probably still favor bringing it forward. I understand the logic behind um, bringing it to a committee and having them look at it more. Um, I've served on some of those, you know, on, on a committee that did something like that around ADU. And I think that process can be helpful. Um, but I, I still, I think I, I, my personal preference, I completely hear what the rest of the board is saying would be to bring it before a town meeting, but I also understand the, uh, the logic behind uh, uh, having a, a committee look at this too. Great. Um, let's see, so is there any other discussion before we uh, look to make a motion uh, for us to, to vote on? Anyone else like to share any thoughts? Okay. Um, so I'll propose a motion and um, see if we have a someone who would like to take it up and second it. If not, um, please suggest a substitute motion. Uh, do we hear a motion to recommend no action on Article 18 with a request for the Planning Department to identify the appropriate uh, committee, either existing or uh, new for study? I would move that. Motion. I could second that. Yeah, I hear Jean with a second from David. And we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. Katie? Oh, sorry, guys. No. <laughs> Katie's no. And Rachel, yes. So uh, we will recommend uh, on Article 18 no action with a request for the Planning Department to identify the appropriate committee, either existing or new for study. Thank you everyone, it was a great discussion. Our next article, excuse me, I have to get my agenda back up, is Article 19, uh, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for ADUs. And we will start with, um, Katie this time. Everyone gets uh, a chance. <laughs> yeah, exciting. Um, so um, I think the challenge with this article has been obviously that we did this at the previous town meeting um, and it came very close to passing, um, but did not because of the two thirds super majority. And so I think some of the comments around this um, centered around whether we should be bringing it up again. Um, with all that said, I, I liked the article that we did at spring town meeting and um, I very much like this one. And I actually, I think I prefer this one um, for having ADUs be by right. I think it is um, really important in some ways as much as possible to remove impediments to this. I think it's a great way of bringing in more diverse housing stock. I think it's a great way um, to um, potentially provide income opportunities for people who are struggling to stay in the town. So. Um, Yes, I, I support this article for many of the similar reasons that I supported um, the, uh, the single family uh, zoning article. I think it increases housing supply in a community that needs it. Um, I also oppose sort of some of the pushes um, to add affordability requirements. Again, I strongly support building more affordable housing in Arlington. I don't think um, pushing the zoning in that matter would be the most effective way to do it. Thank you. I'll go next to Ken. Um, I only have one requested change to this and um, everything that uh, Kathleen said, I agree with. Uh, the only change I, I want to include is this would apply to only existing structures. They cannot build an addition or new structure to accommodate this um, uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, I really appreciate the fact that uh, taking away all the impediments and everything else, but if we 
approve it as is, I believe that you're upzoning everything right up across the board. And because you're allowing additions and you're allowing new construction for this, new footprint that is, you know, I'm not talking about new construction inside, but uh, if, the, if the footprint or, the, or a, a creation of new space uh, is caused by this, then it doesn't happen. But if it, if it can happen within that envelope, I'm all for this. And I think this is a great thing. So I would like to uh, move forward with just that one change. Thank you, Ken. Uh, uh, next, we'll go to David. Ken, I'm confused because does the proposed article limit the ADU to the existing building envelope? It does not. It says that it, 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 you, you could do an addition, unless I'm wrong. I'll be the first one to say I'm wrong, but I, I thought it, there's no limits. You can you can um, build a garage and put an ADU above it, uh, new. Or if you want to put an addition behind the, uh, your building, you can do that. Uh, so, how, so how does adding a requirement of existing structures help here? Because it's all because, because it's we, what's inside. It's it's existing already. You, you you're not. So you so let's say you had a single family house, and you all of a sudden want to add ADU. So you go ahead and add a big addition to this house. Now you now it's a two family house. Okay, so you're you are so you okay. I wasn't clear. You're you're proposing a a limitation here. Correct. Okay. Because we did have we we did have that same limitation in in last year's proposal. Correct. Um, but there was a there was a bunch more other limitations which yeah. I agree with Kathleen that it's too much. I think this is the only one I, I think is the most critical one. That's what I'm trying to say. If I'm okay. not saying it clear enough. I I I think we'd have to think a little bit about where to insert that but I, I understand what you're saying so I I have some substantive concerns but I but I also have more or less the same process concern um, that that I brought up with respect to the last article um, although I think that in in some respects at least the ADU article is is um, is, is a little bit more constrained, uh, although it would apply to more districts. Um, but um, my, my substantive concern is I, I really, I support the idea of ADUs. I think we should approve them in some form. Um, I was very supportive of the article that we uh, put together last year, um, which I thought, while it did have some procedural hoops to jump through, I, I thought it was a measured approach to it to uh, to see uh, what happens. Um, my concern is that if we open the door pretty widely to ADUs, um, and um, it uh, doesn't. Um, end up being uh, working in a way that's positive for the town or in all of, of the districts that it applies to, um, shutting that door is much more difficult than progressively opening the door wider um, as, uh, as you see um, how it's working. It's easier to loosen restrictions than to reimpose tighter restrictions. So, um, you know, I think um, putting a, adding in a limitation on existing structures um, uh, does help, I think. Uh, so that I hadn't considered just adding that. Uh, so I have to give it a little bit of thought uh, while we're talking uh, to see if I, I could support that, but um, I would I would rather I, I would rather take a more measured approach to this. And perhaps what you're suggesting is measured enough. Um, but 
uh, I, I need a, a little time to think about that while, while we're discussing it. Okay, uh, Gene. Um, so let me start by saying I'm also a big supporter of ADUs. I, I do think they should be as of right as this would have and not require a special permit. Um, I'm not as afraid as David is about sort of how wide we open the door because it's not completely widely open. However, procedurally, I, I've read this really carefully. I think this is fatally flawed and needs a significant, significant rewrite. And I'll explain why in a second. And I would want to see some substantive things added. And I don't think we can do that between now and Monday. I actually wrote this out for myself, so I didn't forget, but let me tell you. Um, I think the way it's written um, ends up creating some inconsistencies with the current bylaw, as well as ambiguities. For example, as written, it's ambiguous as to whether two family also applies to duplex because duplex is defined separately than two family in the bylaws. And this would not include duplex, which sort of makes no sense, but it's a little ambiguous that way. And whether two family and duplex dwellings can have only one ADU between them or one ADU per unit or even more. There's absolutely no limitation on any of that. And at one point it defines ADUs as being on the same premises as the principal dwelling, but then it limits ADUs to those in dwellings, which would exclude accessory structures like on a garage. So on the one hand, it says on the premises, but then later on, it says in a principal in the dwelling. So it's ambiguous and hard to figure out there. Um, and the table makes no distinction between whether it's in one or the other. And, it, and so it potentially allows different rules for whether it's in a dwelling or not in a dwelling. It's also unclear if they're allowed in one or two unit and duplex units in the business districts because this only changes it for the residential districts. And sort of me, how could you just do it in the residential districts when there are one in two family and duplexes in the business districts. So it leaves it all out and makes them very unclear. Um, I checked, there are 115 uses of the word accessory in the zoning bylaw. And I think not all, but some of those provisions would apply to this, perhaps unintentionally to ADUs. And we can't quite figure all that out between now and Monday. For example, some of the requirements in 5.3.13 appear that they would apply to ADUs, at least in some circumstances, but nobody's um, really thought that through. So procedurally, it's a mess at the moment. And as one of the gatekeepers, I don't think we can send it forward with all those ambiguities and inconsistencies. As far as the substantive issues, a few of the things that we did last time, I think need to be in ADUs again, unless something else has changed in the world. One is no short-term rentals, um, which isn't in here at all. Um, second is the owner needs to live on the property and in, in you know, either the principal or um, the accessory dwelling. In addition, if you notice, it's, defined as four or more rooms. And even when the proponent was in last time to discuss this, she said, oh, it didn't need to be four rooms. It could be fewer rooms. And sometimes duplexes are still our studios. So I just think that this, I, I love the idea. I, I love where, where uh, Barbara Thornton was going on this. Um, I just think it needs too much work and I can't possibly vote for it the way it is for those reasons. Thank you, Jean. Um, I actually agree with every single one, one of your comments. I had um, a very similar list written down too. I am absolutely in support of 
of ADUs. And I, I do like the fact that this particular article is as of right. Um, I, I agree with you that um, limiting it to the, the R districts when there are single families in the, in the B districts, you know, ideally you wouldn't have that limitation if, if you are making it as of right for any um, single family. Um, I, I also have questions given that the, um, there was no limitation about the owner occupancy. I think that that needs to, to be in there for, for one of the units. Um, also clarification about the, the principal structure and the fact that it allows for the ADU to be up to 50% of the structure, you know, what would then not make it a, a, a two family. So I think that there needs to be some, some additional thought um, given, given there, but um, I, I'm supportive of the concept and the positive changes that were made here, but I agree. I think that there are some substantive changes that would need to be made to this in order to, um, for me to support putting it forward. David? Can I? I'm sorry, so, can, can I, David had his. That's fine, go ahead, David. So it sounds like what we're getting at is an article that looks a lot like the one that was proposed last year, but by right instead of by special permit. Last, no? year, last year, we only did one family. So this is one, two duplex. Last year, well, we right, didn't, but it, but last in terms year we of, didn't allow any expansion in the of the building envelope. There are lots of differences. But I, I think in terms of the uh, of the of a lot of the conditions or limitations we're talking about, it's sounding a lot like the like you're right. It's not it's not exactly the same, but a lot of a lot of the points that you and Rachel um, brought up are things that were in last year's proposal. Right, absolutely. Um, so I was gonna say okay. the same thing, David. Um, <laughs> but would, would the rest of the board be okay with us submitting, uh, approving this uh, with the conditions that it was exactly like what we submitted last year with the exception that is as of right. And then if we need to loosen up some of the strings, we can do some do so later on if it, we feel it's too restrictive. But we can, at least last year we agreed upon all the conditions, except for we, we were relaxing the special permit condition. Would, would the board be okay to accept that as a motion to move forward? I obviously um, was already supportive. The, the most important thing to me is the as of right. I think that's a really helpful contribution. So I would very much support this. Um, and I think a lot of the concerns that Jean raised, and it sounds like the careful discussion you guys had last year, that makes a lot of sense to me. Erin, I'll just ask procedurally. Um, I know that there are limitations to within the scope of this article in terms of the way that it's presented. We we still need to, the changes we need, that we make need to still um, keep it within scope of this particular article before it becomes a substitute um, article. Um, so <laughs> maybe yeah. if you could help us put some boundaries on, on that there, that would be helpful. So you're right, the, the way the article is written, um, it, it definitely hems you in. Um, I think if the best place to add some of those conditions that, that the ARB members are expressing that came from last year's bylaw would be to handle it in um, this new E paragraph where you it, it already starts to discuss some conditions of where or what, how it could be allowed. You could certainly add items here um, that that might be acceptable, but the way that the article is written um, definitely hems you guys in. I, I I guess what I'm saying is that I think if you wanted to add stuff, this section is going to be your best bet. David, my I I think it could be done. My my concern with trying to do that is 
we would essentially be making this our own article. Um, and again, based on what, what we said last year about the process we were going to go through, uh, is that the right way to approach this now? Gene? Yeah, I, I agree with David. And I sort of feel like we could do a little better than we did last year. And I would want to be able to go through what we did last year and sort of have a discussion about picking and choosing what made sense and what we might want to modify. So I don't think it's as simple a process as just porting everything over except the special permit requirement. For example, ours only applied to single family homes. This specifically said in the warrant article, single and two family homes. So we would still have to deal with what that meant. And is it, you know, one ADU or is it one for each unit? So there are still some complications that I don't think we can work out between now and Monday. And I think this is something where we should be ready with the ADU article to take something to town meeting next year. It's not as complicated as, as the single family zoning piece. We're just talking six months delay for that, for this one. Any other questions or, or responses to Jean's timeline? I think that makes it personally, I, I think, Gene, that that makes a certain amount of, of sense. Um, you know, seeing these two here and knowing that from the comments of the board, there are um, there are elements of, of both which, which are desirable, that crafting the right, take, you know, taking the, the small amount of time that it would take to craft um, the right article that's Still more time than we have between now and and the um, the fifth is is something that we might want to uh, take a look at. Um, so, do we? Is this a case where we we just want to keep this uh, in house at the board rather than refer it to a, a committee? Or either that, or we can have that discussion with Jenny, you know, at one of our next meetings about how to make it work. We could have as far meeting as well in December. Good point, Rachel. Yeah. So would we just uh, would we just vote no action with no other recommendation tonight? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. But I I. I think that adding it, you know, making the commitment to add it to our goal setting meeting to um, to to bring it forth at the next town meeting um, would, would be, or at least to add it to our goal setting meeting discussion to you know to to talk about um, crafting what we would need to do to go about crafting an article for the next town meeting sounds seems to be something where um, we might have some support here if we if we don't move it forward or or at least a commitment to bringing a revised article into the public process yes. prior to next town meeting right and we can talk through that process at our goal setting meeting okay um do we have a um, motion, um, sounds like there um, might be a, a motion for, for no action on this particular article. Do we have uh, support for anyone uh, who would like to make that motion? So I'll move. David, I'll do David for the motion. Do we have a I'll second? second. Jean, the second, and we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ken? No. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? No. And I am a yes.
So I believe we need a simple majority. Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong. So we will move forward uh, with a no action vote on this article and um, we will add it to our goal setting meeting. Jean. I would just like to say to the people who sort of like to put that, I really wanted to bring this forward. I did, I did. I just think it's too flawed. I just think there are too many things that need to be fixed. And I don't think we could, and I couldn't in good conscience bring it forward in the, the with all the procedural and ambiguities and inconsistencies at this point. Great, thank you, Jean. Okay, um, the next article on our um, agenda is Article 20. So that's the zoning bylaw amendment with parking reductions in the B3 and B5 district. And I think Jenny highlighted here that there were a couple of modifications that came forth. Erin, is that correct? Right. Um, so I think the top paragraph is based on, is the staff's effort based on the conversation when this was uh, heard in the public hearing. And I believe the bottom paragraph is from Eugene. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I just rewrote it a little bit so it was easier to parse and read and to, for a little more clarity, I didn't change the substance of what the staff had done. Okay. It, 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 it lines up a little more with how the rest of the bylaws read, I think. Great. So let's start with uh, Ken for this article. Uh, I find no issues with this article. I'm supportive of it. Uh, do you have any preference in the in the wording with Jean's? Uh, I read it, uh, and uh, as far as I can, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it being just with word changes. I don't think the meeting has changed at all, like Jean said. So I'm okay with that. Great, thank you. So I'm supportive of as written, or as modified. Thank you. Uh, David. Uh, so I'm uh, sorry, which, does Jean's modify the staff's suggested paragraph? Yes, the bottom paragraph. Jean, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you saw the staff's modification and then rewrote it based on that, correct? So the staff one is the one with sort of the orange highlights. Okay. The, the paragraph below that is I said, let me rewrite that a little bit. So the bottom paragraph there, the one that says when the applicable is the one that I wrote. Okay. Um, no, I, I think I'm okay with that. Yeah, I, I didn't have any other comments uh, to the original language and uh, I, and I'm okay with uh, Gene's suggested revision. Okay, Katie. I'm fine with it as not. A Great. As am I, by the way. <laughs> Perfect. And, um, I agree with the way that that is, that section is we rewritten as well. Okay, um, so given that, do we have um, anyone who is willing to bring forth a motion to recommend um, action on this article? Some motion. Katie, and a second. Second. Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So Article 20 will move forward, will be recommended. Um, as amended. As amended, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now we are to Article 21. So this is a zoning map amendment to rezone town property. Uh, we'll start with uh, Jean. 
I'm I'm fine with it as it is. No comments. I would I'm in favor. Okay, David. Uh, same here. I'm okay with it as written. Okay, uh, Katie. I'm in favor of it as. Kim. Yes, I'm in favor of it. As am I. So, uh, do we hear a motion to uh, recommend? Um, you recommend uh, with action or recommend for action the zoning map amendments in Article 21. So motion. Do I have a second? second. We'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So that is recommended for action. Okay, so that takes us through all of our articles. Uh, any other comments from the board? Great job, Chair. Thank oh, you. Thanks. Aaron, did you have anything else? Um, I think procedurally, we will have a report to review on uh, the second on Monday after the um, continued hearings that we have on our agenda. Yeah, so as uh, the staff has done in the past, we'll put together a report that um, includes uh, commentary, the, the things that I heard and wrote down tonight based on the board board's discussion, um, and then the recommendation um, and the motion if, if that is to be included. Um, so uh, we'll have that with the packet for November 2nd. Um, and uh, if, if the board is so inclined, once you have a chance to review it um, prior to the meeting and then in the open session, um, you can vote to uh, have us submit it on your behalf. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Erin, to you and Jenny and the rest of the staff for all of the work <laughs> in a very short amount of time that you put forward in um, preparing all of this information and that you're still going to be putting forward to preparing all of this. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, so with that, we will adjourn the, um, the public hearing for the uh, zoning warrant articles for the 2020 special town meeting. Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So motioned. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Thank you all, and I will see you on Monday night. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks.